The first guest of the evening is truly a poet. He's an artist. He is a, a friend and an inspiration to anyone who I think who has ever played the guitar uh, or tried to write poetry. Would you please welcome Gordon Lightfoot? <laughs> through fields of green on the summer side of life. His love was ripe. There was no illusions on the summer side of life, only tenderness. And if you saw him now, you'd wondered why he would cry the whole day long. This is Carefree Highway Revisited, the show that celebrates Gordon Lightfoot's music song by song, a proud member of the That's Not Canon podcast network. I'm your host, Mike Messner, and with me today is a fellow Lightfoot fan making his second appearance on the show from Fairport, New York, Ed Lewick. Ed, welcome back. It's great to see you again. Thanks, Mike. It's always good to be here where it feels like home, talking about our good friend Gordon Lightfoot and his song. Yes, and it really is home for a lot of us in a spiritual way, anytime we're talking about his music. Now, we had you on the show back in March of 2022, and you and I discussed Redwood Hill, and I'm happy to say that episode has been heard in nine or ten different countries, and today we're going to be talking about Summer Side of Life from the album of the same name, and I wanted to know, Redwood Hill is a much shorter and much more bluegrass-inspired song. So why did you want to talk about Summer Side of Life today? Well, it really was an important song in my life. Back when this album was released, May of 71, I was just starting out in the record business, and uh, I loved the song. Let's, let's just to put it that way. I found it very hard to be objective about the song. And um, part of my job was to evaluate new albums, new songs, and um, make a recommendation a prediction, so to speak, how well it's going to do. And back when the album was the king deciding whether you're going to make money on the album or whether it's going to lose money, it was kind of important to not go too overboard on your initial purchases. So this turned out to be a rather humiliating defeat for me in that I predicted that it would do well because of the, the previous album doing so well. But as we all know, following up, if you could read my mind, is a difficult endeavor. It was hard to be as good on the next album with any of the cuts. I liked all the tracks, but especially the title track, Summer Side of Life. And I, I made a mistake in saying it was going to do much better than what it ended up doing. Now, why did you like the title track so much? I mean, the album has its own story. And we will talk about that. But why did you like that particular song so well? I liked the flat pick double rhythm introduces the song. Gordon's playing a 12 string and he is almost pounding away. He typically had a capo on the first or second fret. I believe this song was on the second fret. So instead of the C, I believe it's in the key of D. Now, for me, I like the song, and I have to tell you, it's not in my top 10, but I can tell you that it's a cinematic kind of song. It's a really sweeping story, if you want to call it that, but it's also leaves out things that we as listeners are supposed to fill in. And it purports to be a song about the Vietnam War which Canada was not directly involved in. We can talk about that. But it is a sweeping song. And the 12 string that he's playing, it's very clear. And he is kind of pounding it out at the very beginning. But that makes it a lot more muscular song than a lot of his other stuff. And it doesn't require electric instruments to do that. Do you have any personal anecdotes about the song or about the impact it's had on you? Well, yes, uh... It took me a couple of years, but I eventually came to be the type of person that they would refer to in the music business as a music or song guy. Somebody that can listen to a song and give a good prediction as to whether it's going to be a hit or no chance. And like I said, I went overboard on this one. It was right when I got the new job and I was kind of feeling my way around. I didn't learn until years later that I had 
I had earned the respect of one of the top 12 indie promoters in the whole country for getting records played. The regular promotion men for Warner Brothers, Atlantic, the big corporation, but the indies, indie promoters, kind of took over, and these 12 guys backed each other up. If you wanted to get your song played on one of those influential stations, you had to pay some kind of price. <laughs> and I didn't realize it, but during the 70s, I started being uh, taken to lunch and uh, more or less courted, in a way, by one of these promoters. Each of them had a bodyguard. And so m most of the time, I wouldn't deal directly with Jerry Myers. I would talk more to his confidant and bodyguard, and we'd go to lunch. But what they wanted me for was that I had developed a reputation of being able to pick out what will become a hit and what won't. It was gradually over a course of many years. I specifically remember Billy Joel, Just the Way You Are, came out. Billboard wrote it up as, well, this will be a mid-link song. It might top out at 30 or 40. And I listened to it. I, I said, Bill Ward completely missed the boat on this song. It's going to be a top one or two hit song for Billy. And it turned out that way. Huge, huge hit. And so gradually with making predictions like that, more and more people would come up to me with records. Some of the uh, salesmen from the record companies, they'd say, Ed, what do you think about this song? Is it going to be a big hit in your opinion? And I just didn't know. I thought I was thinking, why are they asking me? You know, I all along, somehow, once it got to be known that I was a direct advisor to one of the top indie promoters in the country, Jerry Myers, I was considered a, a guy you can depend on to, to give a good recommendation for a good song. But now, of course, let's say the indie promoter takes a song into the program director of one of those top radio stations in the country, and they start playing the song. Occasionally, there will be a song that the indie promoters, they might have gotten their cut of, oh, whatever it was, 50,000 or something, under the table, of course. But if the public did not like it, there's no way they're going to go out and buy the album in droves. And so mainly what Jerry would ask me is not whether it's going to be a hit. They wanted to know how it was doing in the very early stages. I had access to some sales data on that. I, I must have been very valuable to Jerry because he kept uh, taking me to lunch. The big boss of the company I worked for never questioned it. So what is the best setting for you to listen to this song? Is it sitting at home? Is it while you're on the road? Is it at the, during the day, during the night? When does Ed Lewick love to listen to this song the most? Usually when I'm alone in the house, when I wasn't so darned old, and I had a pretty good voice, and I could play the summer side of life pretty much like Gordon would play it, on a 12-string hammering out double time. So when I'm alone, well, I used to play along with the song and make believe it was a make-believe world. Ed Lewitt could finally sing and play as good as Gordon Lightfoot, which is ridiculous of us. Delusions of grandeur, they might have called it. I did that many a time. Now, when I listen to it, I still enjoy the chord progressions. I really like that bass playing. I think it's Rick Haynes. And there's two female singers that were not mentioned, but I think they were singing along definitely high sopranos. And in the very end of the song, as they're repeating that line, I believe they hit the highest note in any of Gordon Lightfoot's song. I believe it's a high B, and it's way up there. Yeah, I've always wondered who that was who did that. We'll talk about that in a little while. For me, I think I could probably listen to this song while driving at any time of the day and pretty much any location, but I would probably favor either the summer, because the song is about the summer, or mm -hmm. the spring. So I think it would be a little less engaging for me if I was listening to it in a driving rainstorm or if it were really, <laughs> really windy or something like that. So 
Lightfoot has actually said about this song, and I'm quoting from the songbook liner notes. He said, in many ways, it's not one of my favorites, though people seem to want to hear it. It doesn't hold together technically on stage to my way of thinking. It's about guys going to fight in Vietnam. That's the whole driving thought behind it. It's about saying goodbye to your girlfriend and your mother and not knowing if you're coming back, going through God knows what. Do you have any other insight about how the song came to be, Ed? Well, it's just conjecture on my part. I'm picturing Joe Wizard. He produced the album, and I believe it's the only one that he had the sole production value of being called the producer alone without Lenny Waronker. But I think Lightfoot probably had a lot to do with the fine details. But maybe uh, Joe lined up a lot of this, the personnel. Gordon told him, I want to have a big production number. With my last album, I had the song called Sit Down, Young Stranger for the uh, kind of anti-war sentiment. And Gordon wanted to make a little stronger statement, but he still had to put it in clouded language. I don't think he ever forgot what his mother told him. Uh, you don't want to get politics too involved in your song. She was the one who really was into the music, much more so than Gord's dad. I think Gordon got his discipline side from his dad and more his musical side from his mom. So when she said something like that, he probably said, OK, we won't get too political here, but we're, darn it, I'm going to get political. And I want to put out a big production number for a song that's anti-war, but I'll still cloud it in enough words to make it not so political. Yeah, and he's also said being a Canadian, he didn't feel confident necessarily about speaking about American politics. And he did that in Black Day in July, and he did that in Sit Down Young Stranger. But he's not known for being a political musician the same way that Phil Oakes might have been or right. other contemporaries. So obviously he had this on his mind, but it could be seen as an apolitical song just as easily as it could be seen as a political song. I think um, you're right. Because it doesn't mention Vietnam. It alludes to it. And I'm going to talk about that in a second or two. But it doesn't talk explicitly about Vietnam. It doesn't talk about any locations there. It doesn't mention the enemy. So no. it could be seen as just any kind of war song. Although even there, there's only the vaguest allusion to actual fighting. You said clouded language. And I think that's a good way of describing it because that's the language that he used. We'll be back to our conversation with Ed Lewick about Summer Side of Life. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. Hi, this is Audie Martello, the host of the Mostly Folk podcast, a 60-minute foray into the music we all love. You will hear newly released albums, classic folk, country, and bluegrass music, as well as some traditional music that may or may not be true to the genre. Sometimes irreverent, often opinionated, but always entertaining. You may even hear a radio magic trick every so often, as well as numerous interviews via Zoom and telephone with established as well as indie artists. Mostly Folk is available wherever you listen to podcasts and always at mostlyfolk.org. The American West, a place where our character as a nation took shape, where dreams came true, where ambitions were shattered, and where legends were born. But above all, a place where ordinary people came looking for a new life and ended up doing extraordinary things. No one tells the story of the Old West better than author Rick Steber, and now there's a podcast dedicated to his stories and poems. It's called Writing the West, and in every 15-minute episode, you'll hear the stuff most history books left out, but that we can't afford to forget. If you want to hear the real stories of real people in the Old West brought to life, this is the podcast for you. Check it out on Spotify. That's Writing, W-R-I-T-I-N-G, The West, the stories and poetry of Rick Steber. 
So let's start talking about the lyrics a little bit. He came down through fields of green on the summer side of life. His love was ripe. And when I think of green fields, the field could be a battlefield or it could be the jungles of Vietnam that were green before they were napalmed and destroyed. And then green is used to describe someone who lacks experience but it also represents the greenness of that country because GIs that got over there said this is such a beautiful country and I feel so bad that this is happening to the inhabitants. Of course, some of them were involved in the actual destruction of the place, but that's a story for another day. And then his love was ripe could mean that he's kind of gotten bitten by the heroism bug, you know, that he wants to go and be a hero, which we've been laying on American soldiers since at least the Civil War. Um, mm. You know, go and fight for this noble cause and you'll die a hero and everybody will remember you and all these things. And what it amounts to is that young men going off to die and not be able to enjoy their old age. There was no illusions on the summer side of life, only tenderness. And the soldier felt that the war was noble and righteous, maybe, but he's going to be disillusioned later. So when he's talking about tenderness at this point, I don't think he's using it in the romantic sense. Do you? Right. I don't either. And if you saw him now, you'd wonder why he would cry the whole day long. Now, Ed, that's my first sort of stopping point on this. Why is he crying at this point in the song? Because this is just the first third of it. And in the chorus, they're saying, you know, he would cry the whole day long. Why do you think he's crying? I think as he's singing the song, thinking to himself, he's beginning to slip into reality where he may never come back. Or if he comes back, he'll be all shot up. It was a very brutal war. I think that a lot of the soldiers eventually let that sink in that they were probably going to have a lot of trouble. They might have even heard about the PTSD, the post-traumatic syndrome. They came back from this war. They were not welcomed back. And I'm quite sure that there have been more suicides with Vietnam veterans than were killed during the course of the war. I don't know if there have been more suicides. A lot of the Vietnam vets have died of natural causes by this time anyway, because the, we've been out of that war for almost 50 years. Right. But I do know that if you add up the number of killed and wounded and people who suffered from PTSD or some other psychological side effect, it would be a staggering number. And it would be much more than just the men who didn't come back from that war. And of course, we don't know about how many POWs were or are left in Vietnam. Yes, that's right. What I'm saying is that years later, I started reading this, some of the statistics about all of these huge groups of Vietnam veterans that were having big time troubles and just adjusting back to becoming civilians or civilian life again. I think I remember that eventually the numbers of suicide victims was over the amount killed in the war. I, I might be wrong about that. It's a lot. We can agree on that. It was a whole <laughs> lot. I can build on what you said there. I don't know that he's crying the whole day long, but the experience of being in the war has definitely changed him. I mean, this is somebody who has now been forced to go out and take somebody else's life. Perhaps he's been involved in something even more unspeakable than that. The My Lai massacre had only been disclosed a few months before Gordon released this song. So perhaps he's mourning for his brothers in arms, so to speak, who have died in the war. Perhaps he feels betrayed by the politicians or the ones that turned him on to this idea that dying in a war was a good thing. And then the other thing I thought of is that if he's come home in the song, people would wonder why he was crying because, hey, you came home, you didn't get killed, your girl was waiting for you. What are you so unhappy about? Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that they wonder why he would cry the whole day long. That is one of the things that 
Lightfoot leaves out. He doesn't tell us the whole story on this. So we have to kind of figure out what happened between the first verse and the chorus. Yes, that's right. I think that explains it Mm -hmm. very well. There was young girls everywhere on the summer side of life. They talked all night to the young men that they knew on the summer side of life going off to fight. And these are young girls, then they're equally inexperienced in matters of the heart, matters of life. Because they're young, they don't have a lot of years behind them, so they are also green They're waiting at home after they've married or they've fallen in love with young men. And I can see that the protagonist's girlfriend or fiance or whatever, they're talking about, it's going to be so sad when you're gone. But then she's saying, I'm proud of you for what you're doing. And just think how wonderful when you come home. So, you know, the Mm -hmm. night before they ship out or the night before he goes to boot camp, giving the idea that I may never see you again. So we don't know what else goes on, but I can understand why that might be part of what Lightfoot's talking about here. Yes, I really think that a large percentage of those men and women who came back from the war, apparently not hurt physically, but they were never to be the same mentally. It was just too much, too much trauma. That kind of warfare where you don't know from second to second whether you're going to get shot in the back or who you can trust and who you can't trust and all of these atrocities. I mean, heck, I'm I'm lucky I didn't have to go through that. I was in the the first lottery that they had in 1969. They put all the birth dates in a fishbowl and they, they drew them out one at a time. And if you got a low number, you were going to get drafted. Unless, of course, you had some kind of physical ailment. My friend Ken threw out a number seven. And, of course, that was immediately a report to draft headquarters. But he flunked the physical. His feet are flatter than a pancake. So he kind of lucked out that way. Me, I drew out number 269. I think they only got to about 210 that year. And then they they had enough men and women that they needed to fight this war. So I lucked out. Yeah, you did. And we're glad because otherwise we might not be sitting here talking to you. I don't think I would have held up very well. I have a tough time when my pet cat is having problems or when anybody in my family is having problems. You know, I I take it very hard. Watch the the nightly news and every day they'd have body counts and all this fighting that's going on in these jungles where you can't see anything. Oh, just a a nightmare. A yeah. nightmare that would never end for many of those people. Yeah, and perhaps still hasn't ended now that the war is over. We'll be back to our conversation with Ed Lewick about Summer Side of Life. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. Have you ever taken a great high school history class? If you have, then you'd probably agree that the one thing that made it so enjoyable was your teacher. And understandably so. At their best, history teachers are vibrant storytellers, leading you on a gripping, fun, fantastic learning journey. But sadly, we know it can be pretty difficult to continue that journey after graduation, with no one there to be your entertaining tour guide through the world of dense, obscure historical research. Fortunately, 20 Minute History is here to help with that. It's the new podcast that aims to be your very own high school history teacher for everything you didn't learn in high school. Come join us as we explore commonly unknown histories in our informative, engaging, and amusing 20 Minute Episodes. It's 20 Minute History, out now on all your podcasting platforms. Radio is so much different than it was in the 80s. We had it all. The music, the movies, the DJs, and morning shows. Back to the 80s Radio is a show from the 80s in podcast form. We bring the memories from that awesome decade back. Join Toscano and Chang every Friday as they take you on a ride back in time, sharing their experiences and laughs. Stop on by and discover some of the wacky things this crazy duo comes up with. They talk about it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the greatest decade. Don't miss the greatest 80s podcast in the world. Back to the 80s radio. The thing that I wonder about with the girls, because let's face it, that's what the subject of the second verse is. 
that if you saw them now, you'd wonder why they would cry the whole day long. They have their marriage. And in the 60s and 70s, that was for many women, not all, of course, but for many women, that was the end all be all. Mm -hmm. That was what their mothers had taught them, saying, "Okay, your primary job in life is to be a good wife and a good mom. And yet their husbands have come home or their boyfriends that then became their husbands. And they, because of the PTSD or the memories or the guilt or whatever it was that the veterans experienced, it was not the storybook marriage that they were hoping they would have. Right. And that's maybe why they are crying. Sounds like a, you hit it right on the, the nose there. <laughs> so, and then the third verse, it says he prayed all night. And so by this time, he doesn't have any illusions about what's happening. It's not a noble cause anymore. He doesn't want to die a hero. He just wants to stay alive. He wants right. to go home. He doesn't really know what they're fighting for any longer. He knows that they're not going to, they, the United States ostensibly, is not going to win this war, that this is a mess, that we need to go home. But then the most confusing line of the song comes up. Then he walked into a house where love had been misplaced, his chance to waste. Now, for me, when I think of a place where love has been misplaced, I think of a brothel because the idea is love has been misplaced. There's no love there. That's just sex. Those places aren't about love at all. And he's wasting his chance to be really intimate with someone in favor of someone who's just providing a paid companionship for a little while. And maybe there's some sexual activity going on. I've heard other people say that when he walks in a house where love has been misplaced, that it is some sort of hut in the jungle that he's been commanded to destroy, maybe on a seek and destroy mission. So he's going to waste the people who are there. Ed, Try to clear up the mystery. What is this line? What is this verse about? Uh, I think the couple of scenarios you mentioned are quite possible. I, I tend to think of some of these things a, a more uh, ethereal or it's more obviously guessing. Walked into a, a, a house where love had been misplaced. The whole thing about this Vietnam War, at least from my point of view, was love was the last thing on people's minds. It was just survival. I mean, when I talk about people as American soldiers, horrible experience. Let's just hope we could get through it and survive. So there was no love there. Walking into your barracks or wherever it would be over in uh, Vietnam, I really never thought of it as anything more than that. But talking specifically what you mentioned, it, he could have well had that specifically on his mind. I don't know that Gordon ever visited a house of ill repute, and we know he wasn't fighting in Vietnam, but it does make sense that it could be a met completely metaphorical uh, house or that it could be a house of ill repute or it could be someplace in the jungle. So we don't know. And if anybody who's listening to this wants to drop me a, an email about it to set us straight, you know, you're welcome to. The song was on the album of the same name. It was his sixth original album. It was produced by Joe Wissert, and Wissert is still around. I don't think he's involved in the music business anymore, but he also produced Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Boz Skaggs, and Helen Reddy, and The Love and Spoonful, and The Turtles. That is quite a resume for a, a record producer in the late 60s, early 70s. It was recorded from December 1970 until April 1971, and then it was released in May of 71. The United States was still very much involved in the war, although it was removing troops at that point. The last combat troops would leave in 73, and then Saigon would fall in 75. The album got to 38 on the U.S. pop charts, number three in Canada, number 40 in Australia, and I don't believe it charted in the U.K., the song was released as a single, and as you alluded to, Ed, it didn't do all that well. It was at 98 <laughs> on the pop yeah. charts. And you said earlier that that was a misjudgment on your part. But let's look beyond the statistics for a second. 
What to you is your favorite musical aspect? Is it the high vocalists that you talked about a little while ago? No, not not really. Uh, I, I just happened to notice that at the end that they kept getting higher and higher and higher. It may sound strange, but what I listen to are the parts of the song that I could never reproduce myself. The bass run I thought was very good, nice, complex uh, rhythm. And uh, whoever did it, whether it was Rick Haynes or one of the other people listed, that was fantastic. That's really my favorite part is the bass. I think it may have been Rick Haynes. There were two other bassists that were listed in the album credits. We'll never know who was playing on the final take, but you also had James Rolleston and Henry Strzelecki playing bass. And I won't go through all of the musicians here with one exception, but I got to tell you, my favorite musical aspect on this, Ed, is the organ, because you don't hear organ on a whole lot of Lightfoot songs. No, you don't. And even they didn't even list it on the album credits, but I know that there's an organ on this, and it really helps when you're trying to have a crescendo in the song. And then it fades back. It's done very tastefully. There is someone who is mentioned as a piano player, and we can hear piano on the song. There's a guy named Hargus Pig Robbins, but right. there's no organ listed at all, which I think is kind of a shame. I would like to have known who did that. You know what it sounded like to me was the Bob Dylan song, like a Rolling Stone. And it's quite noticeable that that high organ sound in, in there could have been the same person who played on uh, like a rolling stone that was uh, al cooper who did that i don't know where they recorded this cooper just happened to be in the studio he showed up to play guitar when they did like a rolling stone but mike bloomfield was there and so bob said well why don't you just you know go ahead and play organ well cooper didn't play organ <laughs> So that would have been a very strange coincidence. But anyway, that was my favorite musical aspect of it. You did mention the vocals, and there are no female vocalists listed, but the Jordanaires are listed. And this was a group that had done backup vocals for Elvis Presley and Patsy Cline before they worked with Gordon. And... I can hear them, although it's hard for me to hear exactly what the arrangement was. And I'm not sure how necessary it was to have the Jordanaires, because if you had had the two female singers, whether it was Kathy Smith or somebody else, I think that would have had the same effect. But Gordon had his reasons or Joe Wissert had his reasons. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we only can conjecture on. There's somebody that's still alive that might know. From an eyewitness, Richard Haynes. I wonder if he could ever, if we could ever talk him into writing a book of filling in some of these details for us. Well, you know, I have reached out to Rick, and the other person that I might be able to pick the brains of is Richard Harrison, because he was there, had a front row seat for all of this. So maybe I'll shoot him an email and see if he can answer that for us. Gordon only played this song three times in concert, and that makes sense because he said it doesn't hold together on the stage. It is a right. pretty big number. You, I've played this song on my 12-string also, and it's a big song with just one 12-string. But if you add all the other elements into it, it's an mm -hmm. enormous sound, and it's not necessarily characteristic of Gordon. But in any case, he's only played it three times. He played it in West Hollywood once, and then the last time he played it on stage was in Buffalo in December of 1971. And you said that, you know, the highest note of any Lightfoot song was sung you know, on this particular tune. And it takes a lot out of the vocalist to do this song. So I can understand why he would not want to put his voice through that over and over and over again, even if he did have backup singers helping him on stage. Yeah, that's a real energy drainer, I would think. It's a ev hugely evocative song, and I can remember playing it and then feeling, oh my gosh, I need a nap <laughs> right after <laughs> I play that song. There have been 10 official covers that I can find of this, and they are Blackie and the Rodeo Kings, Curly Chalker, Walter Erickson, 
our friend John McLaughlin, Jack Semple, Ove Sundstrom, the studio musicians, Sean Barton Vock, Scott Walker, and the White Knight Instrumental. And I'm wondering, Ed, if you've heard any of the covers and if you had any thoughts on any of them. Well, since you uh, sent me a list of all the covers ahead of time, I figured I better try and listen to most of them, and I did. Naturally, uh, I I was underwhelmed by most of them. Uh, it's impossible to sound as good as Gordon, I think, but there was one female that, that, that I thought did a pretty good job, but can't even remember her name now. And I think John McLaughlin did, did a pretty good job, too. Yeah, he did the best out of any of the ones that I've heard, although when I was thinking about who I would like to hear do this in modern times, I really can't think of anybody. There's no one that I'm saying, you know, wow, you know, Ed Sheeran could do this or Beyonce could do this. <laughs> I'm not hearing anybody. Nobody jumps out at me saying, OK, well, what if they were to try this song? The guy that comes to mind for me is Eric Clapton when he had a, a little stronger voice in his a little mm. younger day. But it could be a, a bit toned down from what the way Gordon did it, more like um, change the world but not that mellow. I like Eric Clapton's voice, and I think he might be able to at least do a a pretty good job with it. And he's covered other songs. I mean, Looking at the Rain is one that Clapton has done Mm -hmm. of Lightfoot. So we know that he has a certain familiarity with it, although it may be a little late in the day, only because (laughs) Eric's voice is not as strong as it once was. Right. So... Any other closing stories on this, uh, Ed, as we're sort of wrapping up? Without beating a dead horse here, I learned my lesson right away that if if I was going to have a a reputation as a good judge of music, there's only two kinds of people that got any respect back then in the music business. One would be somebody that can recognize an upcoming hit song, and then the other would be the kind who might make his reputation either threatened violence or or insults, Uh, when I realized that I was getting kind of deep into it, I got out of it before I still had my health and all my limbs in in one place. I was not going to be bought off. Actually, that was the reason why they kept coming back to me for my opinion, because they knew I was not some paid stooge. The radio stations would always ask for me when they called, and Jerry Myers knew that, and that's why he wanted my opinions on things, too. One of the reasons. That's what this album reminds me of. It reminds me of my beginning in the music business. And eventually, within 10 years, I had to get out of it and find something a little more serious. I ended up becoming a medical librarian. I mean, that that may sound pretty boring, but actually, there's a lot of uh, computerization and contract negotiations when you're the director of a medical organization and their library and their database contracts, all that stuff. What this album and this song in particular taught me was you got to try to look at things in an unbiased manner if you want people to respect your opinion in the music business. Well said. And I'm sorry that you had a kind of a misadventure with this song. But on the other hand, it's still one that has touched both of us. And I'm glad that we've had a chance to talk about it because I know we've been talking about this for a long time. Ed Lewick, thanks again for taking the time today. It's always fun to talk to you, and we'll try to have you on the show again very soon. Oh, Mike, uh, it's very kind of you to say that. And I always enjoy talking about Gordon. He was one of a kind. His music will last forever. And thanks for listening, everybody. If you like this well enough to listen to the whole thing, tell somebody about it. Carefree Highway Revisited is on Apple, Spotify, Acast, or wherever you get your listening matter. Our website is www.lightfootpodcast.com. I'd like to make a special request for you to visit my Patreon page. I love this show so much, and I want to keep it going, and you're in a position to help. Please head over to www.patreon.com slash carefreehighwayrevisited. A dollar or two a month is all I ask. You can reach me, Mike Messner, at teachermike72 at gmail.com. For Ed Lewick, this is Mike Messner reminding you, run for the roses, but don't forget to stop and smell them. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.